complex. Yeah, I just did this Wednesday. <laughs> no, I, no thinking. Right? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, shall we begin? Yeah, so this is the tutorial connected to the cause on uh, stochastic processes and there were a few things I wanted to do uh, in the tutorial. Let us see uh, where we get with that. Of course, I realize the main purpose of a tutorial is for you all to ask questions and we will wel welcome them, but let me start with something that I really wanted to convey. So, you remember we um, actually looked at this problem of random flights okay, and there we said that <coughs> if we consider a random walk even if the step lengths are variable you know uh, we can get somewhere with asking about the form of the final distribution. And uh, what we said is that suppose we draw uh, step lengths from some given probability distribution p of x, okay, which could have some form or the other, you know. And uh, let's say that we had uh, p versus x, for instance, this way. And let's say we define a mean value, which is mu, uh, which is the integral dx px from minus infinity to infinity I and mean, depends on where your p has support I mean the limits might depend on that and suppose uh, times x yes 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 where is that okay we'll put it at the end and suppose we define sigma to be uh, integral dx p of x x squared this is average x squared and I think in the normal definitions of sigma we subtract of mu squared right I mean so let me just do that. So, one sorry was was is there a pro, something to be corrected I think this is right right as far as the de definitions go. So, what this tells you is mu is the mean it is the average value of it the step length and sigma is a measure of the uh, sigma squared it should be Sig right I, I think it is sigma squared by usual definitions is the variance which is the amount of a spread in the step length it is a measure of the spread. Okay. So, this is what it is and then what we found is that uh, if we have a variable x which is made up of many step lengths namely it is the displacement after n steps. So, let us say this was a distribution of this sort could have gone right or left, but may, may be not equally likely. Then this has a distribution and we asked for the distribution of p of capital X after n steps okay. and what we found is that it had the form 1 over root 2 pi n sigma squared times e to the minus 1 half. Uh, okay, so, maybe let me write it like this capital X minus n times mu the whole squared divided by n sigma squared. Okay, what it meant is that you have to subtract of the mean value, but around that mean value you have a Gaussian and the point was that this is a Gaussian no matter what the shape of p of x or provided of course, that sigma and mu are finite. So, just to make it a little plausible you know what is been done here is to start with a certain distribution this is like the normal random walk. So, step length either minus 1 or 1 this is not quite a probability distribution it is not normalized but up to some normalization which you can imagine this is the distribution we start with. Okay. So, n equal to 1 will mean after one step what is the distribution you get and it is either this or that I mean it could have gone. So, there is a certain probability to be at 1 and there is a certain probability to be at minus 1. 
Okay, and now let us see what happens as we increase the number of steps. So, we go down this is with two steps. So, there it is it is possible that you will reach some uh, for is this two steps or two or oh, three steps. Okay. All right, the first one was perhaps uh, one. Oh, no, I am little. The first one was this was three. Uh, the label is wrong, so it's three steps. Uh, so we could have reached site one or minus one or three or minus three. But you already begin to see, of course, it's more likely that you'll be at one because there are more ways of coming back. But now see what happens to the distribution. This should be four, perhaps. Yeah. So just increment one. Oh, this is five. Okay, so one can keep going, but then, okay, six, now hundred. Okay, I mean we can't go through every <laughs> everything or now, but you see this is pretty much like a Gaussian. So I'm trying to make it plausible that it is a Gaussian. Okay, we'll take some completely different starting distribution. I'll take two others and just show you what happens. No, not, not not necessary. I mean, because we will we'll be through with this quite quickly. Okay, let's take an exponentially exponential distribution of step lengths. Okay, so here it is, some exponential. Now, what will happen to this? The first thing you notice, in distinction to the earlier distribution that we started with, is that this has a non-zero mean. Okay, so what we expect is the whole distribution will keep moving. <coughs> a little bit and of course it will, but then its shape will also begin to change. Oh, sorry, I went through two first, maybe that was good, uh, two, three. You see it is there is quite a it is little it's quite asymmetric still, but the asymmetry is getting a little less. Yeah, not the tail exactly. The tail has not yet got up. Now, I suppose we make the big jump. So, so you will see the point just by convoluting by asking for combinations of what can happen. This is by, by the way, the way this was done, Vaibhav Gupta did this simulation, is that it is actually a simulation. So, he did trials with 5 steps or 100 steps each and just plotted the displacement, but he did 100,000 trials. Maybe a little overkill, but never hurts. Okay, nowadays computers are fast enough. How long did it take? Minutes. Okay, but that is still <laughs> oh, all of them. Okay, okay. All right, fine. So, so this is what happens there. La last distribution we will take is where he, I think his average less because it's a little craggy, is a, a square distribution. So we've been looking at p of x being either this or this, and now we are looking at something square. And this one goes pretty quickly to the Gaussian. So are you ready? Okay, so somehow it was felt, I think, by Vaibhav that there is no need reason to go to 100. So he has gone to 15 and satisfied himself that it is Gaussian. There is nothing more, right? So, it, okay. so, okay, so I hope you all are convinced. I mean, no matter what you start with, you do reach a Gaussian. Okay, so that was the purpose of this. Yeah. Huh, the, absolutely. Yes, yes. Indeed. So, the, the Gaussian um, uh, character will hold uh, up to excursions of order root n roughly or of order root n, but um, maybe even 20 times root n or 100 times root n provided n is very, very big, but it will never hold in the ultimate tails. In fact, one of the homework problems you are supposed to do was to find how the function behaves near the tail. 
and it behaves exponentially near the tail and it falls as e to, e to the minus lambda times n. Okay, so, I think we are through with the computer in case one wants, can, can one switch it off? Right, thank you. All right, so th th that was the first thing I wanted to show you. Now, the second thing I wanted to say is that this result, although we have been talking in the language of random walks and you know the step lengths and step lengths could be this big or that big etcetera, but uh, actually this is a manifestation of a very important theorem in probability theory which is the central limit theorem. So, I wanted to tell you all what is the statement of the theorem and also tell you uh, what happens when the theorem does not hold. Okay, so, both things. So, the general question is uh, the following. Yeah. So, given I I D variables this is an abbreviation for independent uh, no what is it I, I identical independently distributed variables okay so in other words when we draw from a probability distribu uh, described by some probability distribution p of x the question is how is x sub n equal to x 1 plus x 2 plus x n distributed. I mean, I am just repeating okay, and I will tell you something about the answer. So, the first thing there is an important result which comes before the central limit theorem in terms of basic results and that is the law of large numbers. Okay. So, that says if mu equal to integral d x x p x is finite, it need not be we have already seen yesterday an example of a distribution which where this is this fails. We will tell you later what happens when it fails, but suppose it is finite. Notice that if mu is finite, it does not imply that sigma is finite. Sigma may still be infinite, but if mu is finite, the following result holds that if you take the ratio of x n to n and you subtract mu, I mean basically it is saying that you know x n over n is approaching mu, then the probability that this modulus of this is bigger than epsilon no matter how small epsilon is given an epsilon, the probability that this will happen approaches 0. for any epsilon is bigger than 0. Essentially, it is yes, yes, that is right as n goes to infinity. Thank you. The probability that x n deviates from mu by more than a given epsilon goes to 0. All it says is x n is approaching mu. And this is the way to say it. Which means, in, in rough physics, uh, 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 physicist language will mean x n is n times mu roughly speaking. There could be deviations, but they will not be of order n. Okay, so, this is the content of the law of large numbers and you can read about it in Feller and okay. Second is the central limit theorem. 
if sigma okay let, let me see is that all that's required yeah sigma is finite and for simplicity we set mu equal to 0 if mu is not 0 you can define a new variable which will satisfy this then rescale okay so let me get it right one second okay let, 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 let me not put in all this in the meaning then okay i have defined x n as that then okay let me just define a new variable y sub n or let me call it okay y sub n equal to x 1 plus x 2 plus x n divided by root n okay then this uh, variable y has a distribution again in the limit then in the limit as n goes to infinity comma y n equal to thing has the distribution or takes on the distribution I think whatever uh, some sort of n you should write n okay n for normal of uh, y equals e to the minus half y squared divided by root 2 pi. Okay, so, uh, the, you know to make a s precise statement yes, oh yeah, 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 okay, sigma f is finite and okay, so maybe we should divide by sigma, sigma squared root n. I think this is right now. Okay, so uh, you know to make a math pr mathematically precise statement, it's better to rescale variables and say that something goes to a limit, and this is what it is. There's still one point which is, you know, little pedantic, but uh, mathematicians will not uh, buy it, buy it unless you make it. Let me let me just mention the point. Actually, the way we have said it is not really mathematically acceptable. They will not accept this statement because, for instance, think about the first distribution that we started with, the two two peaks, and then there were four peaks, and there were many more more peaks. But there were peaks at any value of n. There were peaks. So, if you see what I mean, even if you rescale, there are lots of peaks, and the majority of the axis is not covered. So, if you ask take a particular point and ask are you approaching this distribution, you are not. I mean most likely there will be nothing at that point at that value of y. And yet, we when we look at it we recognize that this is a Gaussian. So, we can easily make it a rigorous statement. So, let, let me just tell you how although I have not written it that way, the way to do it is to integrate the function. So, take this function and integrate it, how, how will it look? Well, so at minus infinity it will be 0, because you are integrating from minus infinity, and by at plus infinity it will be 1, because you have the integral of them. So, it will go from 0 to 1 and every time there is a peak there will be a small step okay, and it will go to 1 in some way with a series of steps. Now, steps are okay in the sense that if you take a limit of this function, it will approach a smooth function. Okay, so, the real statement you should make mathematically is that the, the integrated distribution will approach the integral of this up to some point. Okay, but it is a very fine point, so it need not be stressed, but for those of you who have a mathematical bent of mind, this will satisfy you. 
certainly the way Pella puts it is that in the whole book he does not talk about probability densities, he just talks about integrated densities. Yes, cumulative distribution, exactly, it is a cumulative distribution function up to a certain y. So, by considering, uh, yeah, oh, so let me call it sigma of y equal to integral d y prime p y prime up to y, uh, this approaches a limit in a very nice way and that is what you should know. Okay, but fine, this is good. Next point. What have we learnt so far? Well, we have learnt that if sigma is finite, then no matter what the distribution is, we will approach a Gaussian. It is a tremendously strong result. But nevertheless, we might want to ask what happens if sigma is not finite? What happens if mu is not finite? Is there any statement we can make? The answer is yes. The answer is that we have to, we will approach what are known as the Levy stable distributions and let me give you a brief introduction to those and uh, leave it at that. Okay, but I will draw a line and rather than considering all possible functions, which of course, you know, we would like to, I will consider a family which will go through the full range mu finite, not finite everything and that is the functions, let us just say, okay, let me stick to my notation here, yeah, I think it is this, okay, let me see what have I done, okay, and, uh, fine. So, let us let, let's say we had a bunch of functions which are like 1 over 1 plus x raised to 1 plus alpha. Okay. Some normalization you can put in and let us for the moment imagine that they are positive, x is positive. So, what will this function look like? Can somebody help me draw it? What is the value at x equal to 0? It is 1, right. And at x equal to infinity, it's zero, so it's falling in some way, and it's falling as a power law. I mean, some some something like this. Now, the reason I've chosen this function is that if alpha is very big, the power is large, it decays fast. Second moment will certainly be finite, but as I decrease alpha, you know, you can get other other sorts of behaviors. So, in fact, let us demarcate on the alpha axis, this is the alpha axis, what happens? So, here is 0, yeah, 0 is a little bad because it is, uh, what, see why is it bad? Because it is 1 over 1 plus x. Now, what is the integral of that? That will be some sort of log and log will actually diverge, it will not be normalizable. But anything a little bit away from 0 will be normalizable. So, we will we will leave out the point 0, but we will go up to 1, then go up to 2 and then go onward. So, the first thing we do is we note that in this region sigma and mu are, are finite. In this region, mu is uh, finite, sigma is infinite. Here, mu and sigma both are infinite. And let me denote very pictorially something like this. So, I have an axis undefined axis and I have a starting function here, which is defined by a certain value of alpha. Okay, so, let us say, uh, okay, let, let, let us actually in fact say that here is the axis along which I am starting with this probability distribution with that value of alpha. 
and now I am iterating in the same sense that you saw on the screen. You are asking what is the distribution under iteration as you increase n. So, then the first thing is we notice there is a Gaussian for all values of alpha bigger than 2. So, let us so Gaussian is a very rapid decay what power of alpha what power what value of alpha will that correspond to hmm? sorry somebody said something I could not hear it is more rapid than any power right. So, if you wanted to represent it by a power that power better be infinite. So, somewhere is alpha equal to infinity this is infinity and here is your Gaussian function. Okay. So, of course, there could be functions which decay even faster than Gaussian. For instance, we looked at several like this you know the ones we did or like that. So, in some, so in some figurative sense they are on this side. These are the functions which decay faster than a Gaussian, these are the functions which decay slower than a Gaussian but it does not matter they all land up here. <coughs> if it is a Gaussian by the way that you start with it happily remains Gaussian throughout. So, if you think in terms of these slightly ill defined flows they all converge to a single distribution and that is the Gaussian distribution. This is the power of the central limit theorem this whole region of this plane is drawn into the Gaussian. So, for all initial distributions of any sort so long as these are finite you are drawn into the Gaussian. What if you do not satisfy these constraints is there a limiting distribution? limiting distribution in the sense how is x n distributed can we make a statement about the distribution of x n in the limit of large n yeah. as for large n. Okay, so, the answer is yes there are distribution, but it is not a single distribution in fact, there is one distribution for each alpha. So, if if you start for instance with your 1 plus x to the 1 plus alpha here you will be drawn up a straight line in this way drawn up you could have so it is not that there is only one distribution which will go to that there are many distributions which head to the same limiting value here. So, there is a family of functions on this line which are called the Levy stable distributions you have some notation for that. Mm. I do not, but uh, maybe we can invent something. So, these are the Levy distributions we will just call them all of these are Levy distribution each point and how do you decide which Levy distribution you will go to only by looking at the large x decay of your function. So, for instance here is 1 over 1 plus x to the alpha now suppose you come in with some other function of that of this sort, but also decays as 1 over 1 over x to the alpha at large. Somebody else comes up with a third function, but, but they all decay as x to the minus alpha at large x. Then all these will tend to the same Levy distribution. So, is the statement clear? So, you classify functions only according to the large x decay and you see how they decay if they decay is x to the minus alpha you say okay, that belongs to the alpha family and that will approach a function which is the Levy stable function 
and that will describe the limit. Okay. But what is this function? Is it, I mean, can we write it down? Well, yes and no. We can write down the Laplace transform more easily than we can write the function, except in one case where we can write it. And what I will do uh, is discuss only the answer in this region between 0 and 1. There is the answer is known everywhere. It is a little more complicated to write. Maybe I will request Shamik to make a comment on the region 1 to 2, because I know he knows about that region, but uh, in the context of the model. Mm, well, see if you want to say something, you, you, you decide. But uh, let us uh, uh, concentrate on this uh, 0 to 1 region. 0 to 1 is a pretty opposite region from central limit, because not even the mean exists it is a very uh, sort of uh, broad distribution. 0 to 1 means for instance, typical value you can think about alpha just to fix your is half, it is between 0 and 1. So, like 1 over x to the 3 by 2. It is also a nice value, because that is the value that came in into our random walk discussion yesterday, when we talked about distributions of return times. And that is the only one case for which the distribution can be written very explicitly, we will write it. But as I said, it need, more, need, need not be 3 by 2, it could be 7 by 8, it could be 1 by 4, any, anything in between. Okay, so, what shall we do? Yeah. So, I will so, my aim is just to give you a rough feeling for what the answer is and then we will leave it at that. We will, this is not a very rigorous uh, uh, thing, but let me just indicate. So, first of all, let me tell you the answer as usual, but you have to, but I have to be careful in telling you the answer. Yeah. Okay, so, the answer is the following. So, in the region 0 less than alpha less than 1. Okay. So, we are taking all these variables x 1, x 2 up to x n, n right. And we are saying, we are asking for how is the sum distributed. Now, what should we divide by? Like here we divided by n, here we divided by root n etcetera, etcetera. So, temptation is to first divide by n, but that would not work, because the mean is in not finite. So, in order to get a limiting form, you have to, it turns out you have to divide by n raised to 1 over alpha. Is it 1 over? Yeah. Okay. Then this object which is let us say y, as n goes to infinity, there is a well defined probability distribution for y. So, the most important thing you should remember is this so called norming constant. Never mind the function and what it is, but you know if you have a sum of variables, they do not scale like the number of variables the sum scales is a number raised to some power. Because alpha is less than 1, this power is bigger than 1, 1 over alpha. So, you have to scale by a bigger, because the mean is infinite. You know, so, it, it, so, so, this is the first thing you should remember, this is called the norming constant. I think it is, indeed it is. That is right. So, we will also quote that that result that you 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 once pointed out from Feller. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You 
know, so one of the things you should do is to write down one of these distributions and draw 20 numbers from that distribution and put them down. So, you will have 20. Do it again and do it again and do it again. At least do 10 times. And look at the largest value you get. And you will find first of all that the big fluctuations in the largest value. These numbers fluctuate a lot. And also the largest value is sometimes so large that the whole sum is practically the, just that one number. Okay. So, this is what Shamek was referring to that the ratio the, it is dominated by the large values and if you look at the ratio of uh, uh, the largest value uh, um, largest value to the sum then the average value of that ratio is finite. Okay. It is finite and it is not 1, I do not think it is 1, but it says a hell of a lot of contribution from the largest value to the mean is largely determined by the largest value, it is one of the, those distributions, okay, but that, that is fine, but let, let us write the distribution because that is what we want to do. So, then, okay, so then let me just tell you the answer to start with that uh, um, okay, so we, we, we actually not in a position to write down p of y explicitly, rather we define the Laplace transform of the distribution. Earlier we defined Fourier transform, now for a change we are just defining the Laplace transform of p of y. What is the value of p hat of 0? 1 by half 0 to infinity, but here x is positive. Okay. So, so let us deal with that case. You can deal with other cases, but let us deal with this case. So, the answer for p hat of s is 1 when s is 0. Okay, fine, that is all right. So, now the answer, answer to this question limiting form So, if this is the Levy final limiting distribution L, let me call it L for limit, L for Levy, L for anything, okay. then P L of that p l of s is very very simple, it is e raised to minus s raised to alpha finished. What are we saying? We know the answer for the Fourier uh, for the Laplace transform of the probability distribution and here it is e to the minus s to the alpha, it is pretty simple. Okay that is what it is. How do I, but uh, you are not content, you want to find p l of y. By all means do the inverse Laplace transform, find it, do it whichever way you like. Okay. But let me give you the answer in the case, one case that it is known that, and that is reported by Feller and uh, so this is the p hat hat means Laplace, come back to p y, p l uh, y in the case of alpha, uh, so how shall I denote it, bracket alpha equal to half. Okay, this is the only case for which it is actually known in an, as a nice expression here is 1 over root 2 pi y cubed e raised to minus 1 over 2 y. So, this is the case 
in which uh, the decay is <coughs> 1 over x to the 3 by 2. In that case, this is the limiting distribution. I think it has various names in various places, but at least one of them is Holtzmark. Now, if you have a function, what is the first thing you should do? Plot. Let us plot. Let us at least plot this Holtzmark function. It is sort of typical of the others for the other alpha, but let us plot this. What is the value at zero? Somebody? Well, uh, the, I agree there appears to be something going to infinity as you go to 0, but there is also something going to 0. No, no, y goes to 0, this becomes e to the minus 1 over 0 from the positive side, e to the minus infinity, which is 0. e to, e to the minus infinity will agree is 0. So, it is a question of which one will win, win out. Uh, this infinity or this and the answer is this 0 wins out very handily. This is an essential singularity and it is a very, very, very flat function and y, oh no, y to the 3 by 2 cannot do much to it. So, the function actually just starts very, very flat and says sort of almost flat and then goes up and comes down and goes down with a slow power which you can guess. 3 by 2. So, this is the character of the function. I mean, it is just one more function, but it is like this. We know it, but the power of the function is that no matter what function you started with, we had that series of other functions. So, long as the decay is as 1 over x to the 3 by 2, finally, when you iterate enough, this is the function you land up. But as I said, the important thing to remember really, you know, for applications and so on, is this norming constant. This is important. So, it tells you, that for instance, what does it tell you? So, given a distribution, now how do you characterize it? First thing we learn is you should find the average value. Okay, that does not do much good, average is infinity. Then they said, okay, uh, what else can you do? M median. What is the median, by the way? Nobody knows? Given a distribution, yes? Yeah? Middle value, yes. Good, good, good description. Just, just tell us a little better. What do you mean by somebody else might say average is middle value? No, but you are right, it is middle value. Middle value in the sense that there are as many cases on this side as that side. So, given a continuous distribution, half the area is on the left, half on the right. Okay, so, it will have a median. It will also have a maximum value. Okay, so, the maximum value is very clear right now. We will just mark it like this. Here is the maximum value. And when we say that this scales like n to the 1 over alpha, if you change n and you did not do this norming, then this distribution would keep running away this side. But you have to divide by n to the alpha to bring it back here. So, you know the most probable value which is the maximum median all these will scale like that. Average no. Okay. So, yes. Uh -huh. uh, how does the largest of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's a good exercise. You know, suppose you have drawn uh, n values from this original distribution. Well, let's say from the final distribution. From the 
Levy distribution n draws what is the distribution of the maximum question distribution is difficult ok distribution is too difficult how does the maximum value scale with n so if I draw maybe we are calling everything capital N n times from this levy distribution okay whatever we call it p l how does the maximum value scale with n so shamik this is, is this more or less the content yes Okay, uh, maybe I will leave it at this. I mean, we, we can, we could, if you like, make plausible the norming constant. But you can attempt it yourself. It's now that you have this and that, these answers. This is not so difficult to try to justify. And as a final recourse, or maybe the first recourse, you can consult Feller. Okay, so good. So this is what I wanted to tell you all about these distributions. These are the Levy stable distributions. They are very important because they apply all over. Where do they apply? Stock markets. I mean, uh, where else? I mean, Shamik, can you suggest? I mean, whenever you have uh, uh, mosquitoes, mosquitoes, as, as we commented, these long jumps. Then, uh, well, I mean, uh, more to towards traditional uh, condensed matter physics. I mean, there's a paper early on in the 70s and so on on movement of carriers in a particular sort of semiconductor, which is actually used in Xerox plates. I mean, in those days, Xerox is now getting outdated anyway. <laughs> okay, so uh, the point being that uh, in semiconductors there are traps when carriers are moving they move where they can but sometimes they get trapped and then sometimes the release time from the trap they do get released have a very broad distribution and that distribution often decays as a power law in fact as such a slow power as to bring in this edit additivity I mean this sort of thing in time so you see huh? No, I, uh, what sort of traps are these? I'm not sure, but I mean some sort of uh, potential wells. I don't know how they come in due to impurities. But then imagine you're uh, an electron in a moving along, right? Here, it, uh, here comes the electron. It comes here. It's trapped for a time tau one. Then it comes here. It's trapped for a time tau two which presumably will be bigger because the well is deeper and the well being deeper has a big consequence because quite often these uh, activation processes those times grow exponentially with the well height. So, these are very sensitive functions of the depth. You do not need large variations of depth to get large variations of es escape times. So, you have tau 3 and then of course, if you ask like what is the current going to be or what is the velocity. By the way, you know just on velocity, let me just tell you all. I mean there is all these definitions, right. When we are in school, we learn velocity is distance divided by time. Then we go to college or something and we say, no, no, there are carriers, they carry current. So, current is density times velocity correct it's it's not wrong it's correct but i'm just saying use the primitive definitions most many people have floundered by using more fancy definitions incorrectly so so let's say we are we want to add up the times that we take to reach so what will we do we'll add up tau 1 tau 2 up to tau sub l capital l is bad perhaps n 
and ask uh, what is the total time of transit and the point I am making is that if these the probability of tau goes as 1 over tau to some power law like that then the sum of these times will not scale with the distance. Why will it not scale with this distance? Because it does not scale with n, it scales as n to the 1 over alpha. So, it is a very practical and important consequence. If you have a large sample, you will have a very low current because I mean for the obvious reason that there is a chance you will get trapped, but it will not go down. I mean will not average out. We are used to the idea that you know even if there is some disorder we can average out, average out and there will be a mean drift velocity. No, the notion of velocity will fail. There will not be a velocity. I mean it will take too long and so and let us assume there is a very strong field so that the time to go from here to here is practically 0. Even then would not help. So, so I just wanted to point this. So, this is a very, uh, you know, it, it, it's known to some, you know, the, the, the experimentalists, and they they actually measure these alphas. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about Levy stable distributions, and we still have time. So now we can do uh, other things. Yesterday I had promised to do many things in the tutorial, but I've forgotten what else. So I'm willing to do anything. Sure. One Please. Probability distribution, you have written one explicitly. Yes. Going back to my comment of yesterday. Yes. Is there some condensed matter situation where Schrodinger wave function looks like the square root of this p? That's the kind of thing I had in mind. Yes. It's physically certainly allowed, hmm. but it would have an infinite uh, hmm. position. Well, um, I, I, I do not know very well, but I know Sushil Majumdar in TIFR is making measurements of uh, uh, light intensities uh, in disordered materials. And uh, the last paper I have seen of his, and in fact he told me about it, is full of Levy stable distributions. <laughs> I mean, in the basement with a, with a tiny space and even to yeah, yeah, oh, leaking in the monsoon. Okay, no, but I mean, I don't want to bore everybody with TIFR matters. But uh, five square feet in TIFR is worth I don't know how much to. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but uh, I mean, I had to fight so much with other colleagues to give him whatever little space he has. But he's done wonderfully in terms of ex experiment. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> okay, so. So, uh, uh, but I, I, I do not know, but I think that is a probably a good uh, instance. They, they talk in terms of Anderson localization, which will mean it is a quantum effect. It is, uh, so I do not know enough about it, but, but I think these things apply there. Yes. Hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, uh, you said a couple. Any other comment? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Well, uh, 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 yes and no. I mean, not not directly. I mean, first of all, uh, uh, remember we are looking at a single distribution in a very ideal situation with. Um, what should I say with very uh, uh, you know s single things one, one at a time we are not looking at an interacting system where also there can be rare events, but, uh, but anyway, but within this context there is a lot of interest in the statistics of extremes as they are called and uh, in fact there are some uh, there is a good deal known. Uh, I, I do not know everything myself, but uh, there are these three classes. Yeah, which are the ones? Weibel, Freshe, and there's some accent somewhere. Sorry, <laughs> right? Okay, and uh, one more. Yeah, no, no, the, that one. 
yeah, these are distributions of extremes. Okay, so, I know Frechet applies in the case that you have a power law. So, for instance, suppose we have a power law distribution and uh, we, so it is related to the question that we, I just posed, namely if you draw n times, what is the distribution of the largest? Uh, th that would be one example of that. And uh, there are three different, uh, begins with G, right? I mean, Gumbel. Gumbel. One of them concerns uh, distributions, parent distributions, which have a bound, which are bounded. So, then clearly the largest <coughs> cannot be larger than the bound and the interest is anyway close to the bound, how does the function go. There are others which die down rapidly as you go to infinity and there probably Weibull will apply. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so the forms are universal. It does not depend very much on the uh, actual uh, starting point. And I wish I remembered e to the e to the my <laughs> something of this sort. Yeah, yeah. Since we are being televised and ignorance is being shown, I do not know what to do. But <laughs> right. Uh, does anybody uh, please look up oh. <laughs> Weibull? So, we can at least put down the right uh, distribution. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so the, these are the sort of simple questions one can ask and of great practical importance because when people build bridges and so on, they want to account for rare possibilities, and I do not know how far they do it, you know, in the end there is all sorts of forces at work, but, uh, uh, but they should be consulting these distributions. Okay. So, that is one, but I suspect Varadhan's work has much more content and depth. Not, not extreme. So, 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 so can, can you say a few words about it? I am sure they have all computed, that is why they are not asking. <laughs> right. right. There are correlations. Yes. That's right. <laughs> on its own. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it correct? Almost. Almost. Just make it absolutely correct. Uh, you want the PDF, right? Yeah. PDF. Oh, you whatever is simpler. Simpler. Okay. Oh, this is the cumulative. Okay. So this is what I call capital sigma of y, which is the cumulative distribution. So let's check it. As y goes to infinity, this goes to zero. Ah, one. Okay. Good. That's a good check. All right. So. This is the Gumbel distribution and uh, it is it has a very large region of validity. Uh, maybe, uh, is the PDF very sim very much more complicated? No, no, just add a y term to the first exponent. Okay. E to the minus y plus. Oh, my, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, we'll put a bracket and a positive sign here, and E. Okay, so this is the form of the resolution. All right, so they sort of slightly involved, but there they are. Okay, so are there other questions? Whether or not motivated by the exercises, I don't care, but. Uh, Uh -huh. Oh, very nice. Oh, really? Risks, shares, or something of that sort. Okay, so uh, let, this is probably Jean, J. P. Bosho. So there's a new book by him, and she has a good account of this. Theory of financial risks. Theory of financial risks. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, uh, hmm. Volume two. Volume two. Yeah, I'm sorry. So Levy, you cannot read about from volume one of Feller, but volume two. I would su suggest that uh, you know everybody should order. F uh, fellow volume 1 and volume 2 for the library of whatever. These are available in Indian edition. I actually looked up the cost of mine. I bought mine for 30 rupees. <laughs> T today it is upward of 500. Yeah. But, uh, okay. but still affordable. Anyway, questions or none? Yes. So, first of all, identical is very easy to relax. Okay, so, let me, I, I, I think I mentioned this to somebody, uh, but let me just uh, tell you again. Identical was that meant that we use the same distribution always to draw from. So, if it is not identical, what will you do? You will choose different distributions. But let us, let us at least keep in mind some idea of distributions. You might choose from this, you might choose from that. Let us say there are three options, mm, one, two and three. Okay, three. All right. The one and three look similar, but they are different. Okay. Sometimes you draw from one, sometimes you draw from two, sometimes you draw from one, sometimes from three. Now, how will you do that? You can do that by ascribing a probability of how often you will draw from 1, how often from 2, how often from 3. So, you can approach the problem in two ways. One is given this, I suppose you can build up uh, some suitable mean distribution, but you do not have to do that. You can extract the sigma for this sigma 1 let us call it, extract the sigma 2, two sigma 3, take the squares, put in the, the a prior these probabilities for attack drawing from this, let us call them q's, just not to mix up with p's, q 1 this plus q 2 this and call this some mean sigma squared, sigma squared. Then I believe the answer is the same as before except you put in capital sigma. So, the central limit theorem is unperturbed. I mean it does not it does not mind it is a very inclusive result. Take it in, take it in. Okay. 
Now, the other thing you mentioned was uh, independent. Now, there you have to be a little careful, because the moment there are correlations, they can affect things. So, let us take a familiar example, familiar as a model. Have any, um, so, some of you or all of you heard about the Ising model? Uh, okay. Let me, I will define it in any way, but it will help if you have some knowledge of the model, but let, let, let us do it. Let, let, let me do it and tell you how uh, these results uh, pertain to anything over there. So, the Ising model is a model uh, of spins on a lattice and uh, it is a it is a good model, it is a you might say primitive model, but it is a by the way just one if you will forgive me one moment of philosophy or something not philosophy, but the more primitive the model the better. <laughs> Please keep this in mind in physics what do we do? We try to represent reality. Now, the reality may be simple, it may be complicated, it can be very complicated and if you try to model every aspect of that reality, you will get nowhere. It is therefore, good and it be behooves us, behoove meaning it is the right thing to do, to study the simple things first, then, then go on to complicated things. So, in that spirit, please take it in the right spirit, it is not that you should not uh, study the complicated things, you should, but keeping simple things in mind and in that sense the Ising model is a very, very prime example of that. So, it is a simple model, let me, I can tell you a lot about Ising, but uh, I would not. You know Ising did this work for his PhD thesis, sorry I, I said I would not, but here I, huh? <laughs> That's it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, so Ising, did, uh, 1920s, I think, he was a student of one of the lenses, L E N Z, and Lenz said, "Look, Ising, why don't you study this model? I, I mean, I'm just imagining. I don't know what he said, but uh, solve this model if you can." And Ising uh, went ahead and actually solved it using a quite ingenious method known as the transfer matrix method. We don't have to bother with it. And he found the magnetization and that he did perfectly correctly and maybe he should have stopped there, I do not know. So, what was the result of his calculation? It was that there is no magnetization in one dimension. Well, he promptly gave a very equally ingenious proof that there therefore, can be no magnetization in any dimension. You know, uh, if some of you are interested, I will tell you the proof and leave it to you to find out what is wrong. And you know, on your train ride back, try to figure out what is wrong, okay. But uh, I will not at this moment. But, but anyway, then it turns out that he went finally, I do not know via many places in Europe to the United States, and he was a very good teacher, but I was teaching in high school or college or somewhere, and he did not keep up with research. But this American Physical Society has a habit of moving its meetings from place to place. And one day it came to the town in which he was teaching. So, he out of interest he went and attended one of the sessions and he kept seeing his name being flashed. <laughs> so, he was pleased, but he did not know what it is all about. Okay, I have uh, exaggerated, but, uh, so, but here is the Hamiltonian he dealt with. Okay. And uh, you may or may not have a small magnetic field, let us put it on and uh, this is the model. So, what it describes is spins on a lattice where the energy is lower j being positive if spins are parallel on nearest neighbor. So, you will agree that a spin here is not an independent variable in the sense that 
given this Hamiltonian, there is a certain what should I say uh, weight for a particular spin configuration and you are supposed to do a sum over all spin configurations to find out. So, so this is an example of a system where you do not have uh, independence of variables because uh, something is going to. Now, in such a case will central limit theorem or anything like it apply. So, it turns out that this model is very rich and it has a phase transition as a function of temperature. So, there is a critical temperature T c below which there is a finite value of the magnetization which means that if h is very very small, but not 0 and you look at the system it will enter into a state where the majority of spins are one way or the other. Okay, having said all that let us ask what happens above T c above T c the variables are still correlated, but if you ask for okay, so the analog of our, uh, you know the what we want to ask for is for the sum of random variables. So, in fact, the sum is the total magnetization here. So, let us just call it capital M. If you ask how is this distributed, answer is Gaussian. Okay. So, there is the central limit theorem is operating in some sense. However, the width of this Gaussian has a lot to do with the correlations and this Gaussian gets broader as you approach T c. So, when I say it is actually I, I should revise my statement I mean this is as a function of capital M that the width gets broader, but if I plot it as a function of M equal to M over N then this becomes a delta function always and stays a delta function you cannot make out, but if you expand that delta function out by multiplying by n then you see the structure. In fact, the width is proportional to this magnetic susceptibility and it tells you a lot of things. So, what is happening I will tell you roughly speaking in all these phenomena there is a very basic concept namely the concept of correlation length a correlation length is the length over which spins effectively interact. So, literally speaking they are interacting only with neighbors, but if they send a message you know line up that fellow will also send a message ultimately it will die down because of temperature and other effects you know noise, but up to a certain length that message will reach let us call that the correlation length. So, then what I the basic thing I want to say is the following I will just say that and stop if you draw regions of size correlation length here there everywhere things inside that are very correlated cor that central limit theorem does not work here, but between patches it works perfectly. So, once you d get a unit which is basically not interacting so much the central limit theorem works better. Okay, and actually even in the ordered phase and so on, but let, let me stop here. So, this is an example where the correlations are very important in producing order, but yet uh, yeah sorry ah good good point yeah. So, okay, let, let, let us uh, address this. So, suppose I asked for P of m the probability of the magnetization m as a function of n above T c it looks like this some peak here below T c it can be one of two values it's either plus m or minus m and these widths are also proportional to I mean tell you something about susceptibility, but what about at T c? Well, the point is that at T c this correlation length is infinite. So, 
So, th this is the one instance in which no matter what, how much you hope, some, it won't work. The central limit theorem will fail. This probability distribution of magnetization approaches a universal new function about which much is known, but it is not a Gaussian. Right? Okay. The many things you can say about these, these are the sort of n new s laws of critical phenomena that people have learnt over the decades and uh, there is much to learn. This function is universal, let me just tell students, whether you have Ising spins or whether you have 5 fourth field theory you, or you have spin 5 halves, it does not matter, details do not matter. This function at T c which is, uh, I am trying to recall the shape. In 2 D, the shape is something like this. In 3 D, I think it is a single peak function, but uh, whatever the fun this is a universal function, does not depend on details, just like critical exponents do not. No, uh, no, no, not necessarily. Yeah, well, so long as you don't tamper with the alpha, it will work. You will get a Levy stable distribution. If you ask the interesting question that is asking about variable alpha, it is a very interesting question. I suspect there is a way to answer it, but I do not know the answer offhand. It is a good question. I, I, it's, Shamik, do you have anything to say? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, good, I don't know. Yeah. So, so long as you have the same alpha, if you vary the function, it won't matter. Okay. Any other question? Yes. With this uh, n to the 1 over alpha? Uh, uh, okay, no, so it, it, the two parts. One is I just stated a result. This is a result which is required, I mean, uh, which, which, which is proved uh, about the distribution and the distribution of this scaled variable. So, are you talking about this? Yeah. So, the connection I was trying to make is the following that here this is on the scale of let us say 5 nanometers that I am drawing, but in 1 centimeter there are many nanometers. So, this will uh, continue you know for a long while and the carrier as it is going will be moving along and let us say it encounters many, many uh, 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 you know of these traps. I am also assuming there is a field which is pushing it, so it is not coming back, it is not diffusing, it is going forward. Then a fair estimate of the time will be tau 1 plus tau 2 plus tau n to reach a distance proportional to n. Let us say there is some len, you know, sen, um, length scale we put in here. This is the length, but it has gone through n of these trials where we have added up the tau's. So, now we have a sum over tau i to do. Okay. So, that is the connection x here is like the tau, but in so far as there is a limit of anything, this actually scales like n to the 1 over alpha. Forget about the niceties of the function. If alpha is uh, half for instance, this would be like n squared. So, therefore, the speed would be distance divided by time. So, this would uh, go like 1 over n. I mean uh, uh, 1 over, one can write it in general, 1 over 
alpha minus 1. Okay. But since alpha is less than 1, this will go to 0. So, if you have a sample and if you have double the size, the time taken will go much more rapidly than double. So, think of the following problem. You have a straight line, you release something here, it goes there. Okay, and uh, at a finite, you know, with the whenever it's here and it's moving there, it's going at a finite speed. But suppose you have random branches here of random lengths, and you know, since as I told you, suppose you have a field acting this way, there's a potential energy associated with coming out of this, which will grow in time. Okay, now the question is if you have carriers moving along here, will they have a finite speed or will they have zero speed if you account for the times of this. So, there is a big there was some controversy in the literature on this, but I will not uh, get into that and it had to do with definitions finally. I mean is speed distance divided by time or is it Mm, current divided by rho, because you can convince yourself that there is actually, if you put an infinite reservoir, there is a finite current. Okay. Then, okay, let me not get into detail. I mean, the question is how you actually compute density, it turns out. But it is always best, we, we figured, that to use distance divided by time, and that is always correct, in which case the speed turns out to be 0. Okay, this is too sketchily described to be of any use. Yeah. Well, there's still five minutes in case anybody wants to ask something. Otherwise, we'll just stop. Um, if you get a chance, do look at the exercises. You know, I mean, that's not compulsory, but just at least look at them. You know. Or at least fold them in your carry carry them with you. <laughs> Some osmosis. <laughs> in the old days when Xerox was very difficult to do, we would often Xerox papers and it was such a big accomplishment we didn't then bother to read. Them. <laughs> right. Anyway. Okay, so uh, Shamik, can I declare this close? Okay, uh, do you want to ask the teachers to meet? Okay, when now? Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to request the teachers amongst you to just meet us briefly. Can you all stay behind for about five to ten minutes while the others have? To